let me introduce our first speaker, Iran Segal. Dr. Segal is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Prior to his current appointment, Dr. Segal earned his PhD from Stanford University and then held an independent research position at the Rockefeller University in New York. Today, Dr. Segal's lab is made up of a multidisciplinary team of computational biologists and experimental scientists in the area of computational and systems biology. His group has extensive experience in machine learning, computational biology, probabilistic models, and the analysis of heterogeneous, high-throughput genomic data. Dr. Segal's research is focused on the role of nutrition, genetics, and the microbiome in human health and disease, with the goal of developing more personalized preventative and therapeutic options. Dr. Segal has published over 120 papers and has received several awards and honors for his work, including the Overton Prize, awarded annually by the International Society for Bioinformatics to one scientist for outstanding accomplishments in computational biology. He was also recently recognized with the Michael Bruno Award, which recognizes Israeli scholars and scientists of truly exceptional promise in their respective fields. Recently, Dr. Segal was elected a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and is a member of the Young Israeli Ac Academy of Science. Thank you, uh, Betsy, and I'd like to um, thank the scientists for uh, hosting this webinar and also uh, to uh, G DNA Genotech um, and for the opportunity to, uh, to present our, our research. So uh, my lab for the past uh, six years has been uh, heavily focused on the study of uh, gut microbiome and its role in um, uh, health and disease. And um, the projects that I'll be discussing today were done in collaboration with my friend and colleague also from the Weizmann Institute, Iran Elinav, and he'll present the uh, second half of this webinar with uh, some of our joint projects. Um, now, over the past several years, we've been uh, heavily focused on metabolic diseases due to the high rise in both obesity, diabetes, and um, other uh, related illnesses. And uh, we've been doing uh, work in several projects uh, in this area, shown uh, in the slide here. Um, in one project that we published uh, several years ago, we focused on artificial sweeteners, which the vast majority of us consume on a daily basis. They've even been recommended by the American Diabetes Association as a means of replacing uh, sugary drinks and potentially having benefits for diabetics. But uh, because of the um, high correlation that one observes between people who are uh, overweight and diabetic as being the ones that typically consume artificial sweeteners, we thought that it's legitimate to ask whether perhaps the sweeteners themselves may in fact be causing some of these conditions. And uh, in a series of very elaborate experiments, which um, I won't focus on today, I'll, I'll just mention a few, uh, we showed that if you take gut microbiome from a wild-type healthy mouse, and um, you grow those uh, gut bacteria uh, in vitro in the presence of artificial sweeteners and then transplant them into germ-free uh, uh, mice that never uh, uh, saw artificial sweeteners, you can induce uh, various symptoms of diabetes in the recipient mice. And in preliminary experiments in humans, we showed that uh, short-term consumption of artificial sweeteners can alter uh, human microbiome composition in humans such that when transplanted into germ-free mice also causes uh, symptoms of diabetes. Uh, in other projects, we uh, looked at circadian rhythmicity, and uh, this is uh, uh, something we've heavily researched, and uh, Iran Elinav will, uh, will elaborate on uh, this line of work. And what I'd like to uh, focus on today are two uh, stories. The first one is an unpublished story, in fact, a uh, some version of the story is already published in uh, BioArchive, was posted on uh, BioArchive. And here we ask really a very fundamental question about microbiome, which is uh, what determines, in fact, our microbiome composition? So in the past um, several years, there's been several studies that found various associations between our microbiome composition and the genetics of the host, the human genetics. So a few studies found several um, bacterial taxa that were shown to be heritable uh, by, uh, by genetics. Um, and also genome-wide association studies have identified several 
individual single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs that have been associated with a specific bacterial taxa, suggesting that there is a role for human genetics in determining microbiome composition. However, in parallel to these works, there were other works showing, for example, that the oral microbiome is uh, dominated by environmental factors and not by host genetics, and other studies uh, found very few associations uh, with um, hum between human genetics and uh, bacterial taxa. And so uh, we wanted to take, uh, to study this question in a comprehensive, systematic way to, to answer really this fundamental, fundamental question of what determines our microbiome composition. And so uh, we assembled a large cohort of over 1,000 participants. And in these participants, we measured uh, host genetics via Illumina SNP arrays. We measured gut microbiome collected uh, through the Omnigene um, gut kit by DNA Genotech, and we uh, measured both 16S and metagenomic uh, microbiome composition and function. And alongside with those uh, omics measurements, we also measured an extensive profile from each individual that included anthropometrics, various body measures, blood tests, and medical background and food frequency questionnaires. Um, now, Israel is actually uh, where we conducted the study, is actually a very good place to uh, ask fundamental questions in genetics because we have in Israel, uh, only in the past several decades, people coming in from very different uh, origins, some people from, um, uh, from uh, Eastern, Western Europe and various other places, uh, so people of different uh, ancestral origin coming together to uh, live uh, essentially under a very um, common environment. So one can really ask uh, fundamental questions such as, um, uh, uh, relationships between genetics and uh, different factors. And so um, with our data, the first question that we asked is whether people with different uh, ancestries, what is the association that they have with microbiome? And so uh, first, what you're seeing here is a principal component analysis plot of the genetics of the host, which as expected, segregates very well with the ancestral origin. So suggesting and demonstrating here that people with different ancestry really have very different genetics. Now, um, what we then did is to do the same type of principal component analysis, but now using the microbiome data and overlaying ancestral origin on top of that, here we found no association between uh, genetic ancestry and uh, microbiome composition. One can look at it uh, also by uh, the dis distribution of different, uh, different phyla and also we see no difference between the different uh, ancestries. Um, as a more direct way, uh, one can also examine the distribution of pairwise similarities in the microbiome uh, composition between uh, individuals that have the same ancestry uh, or that have different ancestry, and we see no association also on the uh, plot on the right showing that even in admixed uh, um, uh, populations, so mixed ancestries, also no difference between the amount of ancestry shared and microbiome uh, similarity overall. Um, as another global uh, measure, uh, somewhat um, uh, more, more global, one can look at uh, genetic uh, kinship. So this is overall similarity between the genetics of any pair of individuals and comparing that to their similarity in the microbiome. And also here we find zero uh, association, zero, zero correlation uh, between the two. Um, and so that uh, is kind of on global measures. We find uh, in our data no relationship between microbiome and human genetics. So, so then we wanted to, uh, to look uh, deeper into perhaps um, we're seeing um, more fine resolution associations at the level of individual SNPs. And so we did, uh, using our data, just the standard genome-wide association studies. There were a few bacterial taxa that passed the uh, cutoff, uh, the standard cutoff of five times 10 to the minus eight p value. However, we had over 300 bacterial taxa that were being compared. And when we do the multiple hypothesis correction, we find no significant association between any SNP and any bacterial taxa in our data. Um, looking at trying to validate um, uh, over 200 uh, loci in the human genome that in previous studies have been reported as, as associated 
Only seven of those uh, replicated uh, within our study, um, uh, several of them within the lactose uh, tolerance uh, uh, region. Um, so, um, so that's by our data. Now in uh, human genetics, a very, the ideal way of, of asking of overall heritability of some traits is, is to do twin studies. Uh, luckily, there was a very nice uh, paper published uh, several years ago um, uh, looking at uh, uh, over 1,000 pairs of twins and uh, studying both their genetics and their microbiome. And so we took the data from that study, and what we did here in the plot that you're seeing is we plotted uh, using the p-values provided for heritability by that paper for each bacterial taxa. We just summed up the overall heritability uh, weighted by the p-value provided in that paper for um, uh, for association, we summed up the abundance so that one could look at the overall abundance levels in the microbiome that is actually heritable according to the twin study. And uh, when we use the standard cutoff of 5% corrected for false discovery rate, we reach about 2% of the overall bacterial abundance in the microbiome as being heritable. And that's kind of as a, as a lower bound. And if one takes an upper bound without doing any correction, which clearly has a lot of false positives, you also reach only 8% uh, of the microbiome as being uh, heritable. And so uh, combined both with our analyses and these analyses and the other papers I mentioned and together with uh, the twin studies, uh, our current conclusion is that uh, human genetics, in fact, accounts for only a very small fraction of the microbiome composition. And so if it's not the human genetics, then by default it has to be uh, environmental factors. So we wanted to then search for direct evidence um, uh, to, that, uh, to that link. Um, and indeed, in, um, in the first set of uh, experiments that we did, we, we saw that individuals that either share the same household at present so uh, say husband and wife who are not genetically related or individuals with uh, first degree relatives who in the past have shared uh, the same household, these individuals have a more similar microbiome composition than do unrelated individuals or second to fifth degree relatives who uh, most likely do not and have not shared a household. So suggesting that, that again, that environment um, causes, uh, determines, uh, or associates with uh, similarity in microbiome composition. And we saw that at several different levels, either at the bacterial gene level, species level, or uh, phylum level. Um, so next, oh, I have some issue with the slides here. Okay. So um, uh, after that, we wanted to, uh, to uh, look for more uh, direct evidence, so trying to now really explain directly the microbiome composition via all of the environmental factors that I mentioned before that we collected. And so without going into uh, the gory details of the map, we used the linear mixed model framework here, which is uh, standardly uh, used, and we saw that our environmental factors, the ones that we collected, which obviously are only a set of all of the environmental factors that could be collected, these together explained 20% of the microbiome beta uh, diversity matrix. And you can see here the different features that contributed to this explanatory power, and they're really, uh, they consist of various uh, blood measures uh, and various uh, dietary factors, such as consumption of uh, different types of uh, products, uh, which you can see here. Uh, also uh, medicine, uh, different drugs that people take, also contributed in various, uh, in various other uh, factors. So, uh, so, so, so this shows at least a statistical association that uh, whereby within the environmental factors, even those that we collected, which also obviously are both a subset and even a noisy uh, subset, uh, they can explain, in fact, 20% of the microbiome beta diversity matrix, much more than uh, with our data we could explain with human genetics. So uh, given at this point that uh, we saw very little dependence, very little relationships between host genetics and gut bacteria composition, uh, uh, we wanted to ask what is the relative contribution of both host genetics and microbiome to explaining, at least in a statistical sense, uh, different host phenotypes. Obviously, host phenotypes are 
uh, really effective and influence uh, uh, many different aspects. So they're influenced by the host genetics and then they're affected and they affect lifestyle and diet and, and microbiome. So this is very, uh, very intricate uh, relationship. And in this case, what we wanted to ask is what is the contribution um, of the gut bacteria to explaining in a statistical sense human phenotypes after we account for all of these other factors, including human genetics and um, other uh, environmental factors that we can account for. And so here uh, we turn to a very standard framework, which is used in statistical genetics to look at heritability. And uh, the model that is being used here, it's uh, again, these linear mixed models, uh, which essentially model human phenotypes as a multivariate normal distribution with covariates as different uh, risk factors. These can be uh, age, gender, uh, diet, or any, any other thing that we think influences uh, the phenotype. And then one uses a genetic uh, covariance matrix. So this is a matrix where the covariance uh, resembles the um, genetic linkage between different pairs of individuals. And essentially, this model evaluates the contribution of this genetic covariance matrix to explaining the overall phenotype. Um, and so, uh, and this is very commonly and standardly used in the field of statistical genetics. And so what we did was to extend this framework to our setting here, whereby we also model phenotypes as a multivariate normal distribution using linear mixed models, and again, using covariates, but this time we also add the genetics as covariates, and now our covariance matrix is actually taken from gut bacteria. And so essentially this model now um, uh, evaluates the contribution of gut bacteria to explain the phenotype after accounting for all the covariates that we included in the model and for the contribution of human genetics. And so, uh, and again, some of the details of this are uh, posted in our bioarchive uh, presentation. And so this model really models uh, the phenotype as the sum of a, a host genetic effect, a microbiome effect, and an environmental effect. And uh, what, we, uh, what we found is that there were several human traits that actually could be explained in a statistical sense, so this is by no means to apply causation, but in a correlative sense, they could be explained by, um, by, by microbiome with a, a very high degree of percentages. So if you look, for example, at uh, HDL cholesterol, close to 36% of the variability in HDL cholesterol could be statistically attributable to gut bacteria composition after accounting for the contribution of host genetics and different uh, environmental factors. And interestingly, the uh, degree of these uh, contributions of microbiome to these other traits is in fact on par and sometimes even higher than that which has been reported as attributable to human genetics, which you can see um, on, on the right here. And another interesting note is that um, our estimates of bacterial contribution were computed from our relatively modest cohort of 1,000 individuals compared to the cohorts of tens of thousands of, indi of individuals from which the genetic estimates were, uh, were derived. Um, so, uh, so, so this is one way of, of assessing these, uh, uh, the contribution of uh, microbiome to uh, various host phenotypes. And uh, as another measure, we wanted to ask w whether the contributions of the host genetics and microbiome are complementary or whether they replace each other. And we hypothesized that they would actually be complementary because uh, uh, everything that I showed you so far suggests that human genetics and gut bacteria are by and large independent. And so uh, now we turn to a more standard machine learning predictive framework, and we try to predict each of the different human phenotypes that I showed you before. And what we found is that uh, when we add, when we take a basic model that only has age, gender, and some measure of uh, dietary factors, if we add microbiome information, we increase the predictive power. If we add genetic information, we increase the predictive power. And if we add both, interestingly, we increase the predictive power to be the sum of the addition that we get from adding just the microbiome or adding just the uh, genetics. So this really suggests that the two factors are really contributing independently and therefore should probably both be integrated when we try to study 
a, a human trait of interest. Uh, and finally, we collaborated with a group in the Le Netherlands from the Lifeline uh, Dutch cohort. And uh, very nicely, we could see that when we apply exactly the same uh, uh, methodology and analysis to this uh, entirely independent cohort, largely of the same size, about 1,000 individuals, we see that um, the microbiome, also after accounting for human genetics, explains a relatively similar fraction of the variability in these different human phenotypes, as does the uh, Israeli cohort. So very consistent results that we get here between uh, our cohort um, and the Dutch cohort. So summarizing uh, this part uh, of the talk, trying to really understand, understand what determines microbiome composition, uh, we believe that uh, microbiome composition is, is mostly dominated by environmental factors rather than by host genetics. And our estimate is that only a few, uh, uh, a few percentages of the microbiome uh, composition and function is in fact attributable to human genetics and, and the rest is, uh, is environment. And when we integrate microbiome, we could, uh, we could explain in a statistical sense uh, and find associations with human traits to the same degree that we can uh, when we use uh, human, uh, uh, human genetics. And so we believe that uh, both of these components are uh, important and interesting to, uh, to integrate and they really uh, um, contribute uh, independently to different human phenotypes of interest. Um, so I now want to turn to uh, to the second story that uh, that I wanted to discuss, and this will then uh, lead nicely to um, the different uh, projects that uh, my colleague Iran Elinov will uh, will present. Um, and so, um, in another line of work, we we studied uh, uh, nutrition, and, and we try to understand what uh, healthy nutrition is. And, and as you may very well know, if you follow just the popular media, you, you'll, you'll know that uh, uh, we've been really changing very drastically the recommendations of healthy nutrition to the general public, sometimes saying that cholesterol is in fact bad for you in 1984 and then 15 years later, saying that actually cholesterol is good for you and, and so on and so forth. And, and so we really wanted to take an unbiased scientific approach to understanding what uh, health and nutrition is. And uh, uh, the first thing that we asked ourselves is what we should focus on in terms of what is healthy nutrition. And after giving it a lot of thought, we decided to focus on blood sugar levels and more specifically on the post-meal or post-prandial blood glucose response. These are the changes in your glucose levels in the two hours after you eat a meal. So if you eat a meal with carbohydrates, your body digests the carbohydrates into, uh, into uh, sugar and, and releases that and into the bloodstream. A healthy individual then responds by secreting insulin, whose job is to uh, lower the glucose levels to normal levels. But if you happen to uh, have had a very high spikes of blood sugar levels, your body may over-secrete insulin, which may cause um, um, blood sugar levels to go even below baseline, even below the levels before we ate the meal, and that may cause you to feel hungry and then uh, uh, behaviorally uh, to eat more. So these blood sugar levels after eating a meal are very much uh, related to, uh, to weight gain. In addition, insulin also signals the body to store excess sugar as fat, and this is one of the primary ways uh, by which uh, we gain weight. So it's very, uh, uh, very clinically relevant to, uh, to weight management. It's also very relevant, obviously, to diabetes, and it's been shown be relevant for, to various other medical conditions. And if we compare that to a more standard measure of healthy nutrition like change in body weight, we think that it has a lot of advantages because it provides really a direct measure for the effect of every individual meal as opposed to looking at change in body weight in response to a diet, which takes many weeks or even months uh, to change. And, and, you, and so you, you, uh, you have to wait a very long period of time and then uh, you only get one measure, which is really affected by many, many different things that have happened over the course of these several weeks uh, or months. And, and as opposed to these post-meal blood glucose responses, which uh, using continuous glucose monitors, which are now available, one can measure uh, continuously glucose levels uh, throughout an entire week and then obtain up to 50 uh, uh, re uh, healthy responses to both large and small meals that a typical person consumes over the course uh, of even one week. Um, so, uh, so we focused on uh, these post-meal glucose levels, and, and it's 
essentially the same cohort that, uh, that I mentioned before, um, uh, where we studied the genetics and microbiome. We also connected all of these individuals to a continuous glucose monitor for one week, during which individuals logged on a mobile app that we developed all of their uh, food intake. And so together, we had blood sugar responses to about 50,000 uh, different meals, so 50,000 measures of uh, health and nutrition. We called this the Personalized uh, Nutrition Project. And um, uh, as mentioned before, we had together with all of these measurements, all of this extensive microbiome genetics uh, and therpometrics, blood tests, and, and uh, other uh, questionnaires. So just to show you what the data looks like, here is the trace of blood glucose levels uh, throughout an entire week measured every five minutes, where you can see in the zoom in on the bottom, uh, after this individual reported eating either uh, a breakfast, lunch, or dinner, blood glucose levels go up. They go up differently after each meal because it depends on what that individual had uh, in each meal. And we can use the area under the glucose uh, uh, curve as a standard measure to quantify the response of that individual to a particular meal. So the first question that we ask is how do different individuals respond in terms of blood sugar levels when consuming exactly the same uh, meal? And, um, and to measure that, uh, what we did is in the mornings, we actually provided the breakfast to uh, the, uh, all participants. So after the night fast, participants consumed either bread, bread with butter, or glucose. Each of these was consumed in uh, replicates on two different days. And that allowed us to really compare how uh, does the response of the same individual to the same food uh, compare on two different days as compared to the response of different individuals to the same food. And uh, the results have been published, so uh, I'll just give you the, uh, the, the, the summary of that, which is that essentially for every food that we uh, examined, what we saw was a very striking difference in how different individuals responded to consuming exactly the same food. So this is shown uh, as an anecdotal example here for four participants eating bread. You can see blood sugar responses being very reproducible within the same participant eating the same bread on different days, but highly variable between different individuals with uh, the bottom individual here having essentially no response to consumption of four slices of bread and another individual at the top having a very uh, dramatic, very high uh, blood sugar response. Uh, and so uh, even before continuing, when we saw these results, obviously, um, they're really striking because uh, what they what they show, what this data demonstrates on a, on the largest scale that has been shown to date, is that any dietary recommendations that we'll ever give, which will be general, will always have limited efficacy because different individuals will have uh, very different responses when consuming uh, the same uh, the same food, and maybe that explains why we've also been changing the recommendations. Uh, 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 over the years because essentially there's, there's no uh, one-size-fits-all diet, uh, at least as far as blood sugar levels go, which, which as I mentioned, are, are very key, um, uh, a, a, very, a very key marker both for um, a healthy eating, weight management, and, uh, and disease. Um, and so the next thing that we wanted to ask uh, in the study was obviously to go back to all of the different measures that we had for each individual and ask whether any of these associate with the variability that we observe in people's blood sugar response to food. Um, and indeed, we found many such associations to different blood markers, to different uh, anthropometric measurements. But the most novel associations that we had in this study were associations that we found between gut bacteria and variability in blood sugar response to food. And that's shown in the heat map correlations here, either at the level of 16S composition, metagenomic uh, composition, or at the functional level by the enrichment of different bacterial pathways that uh, exist in different people, those also, some specific ones were associated with the response, variability in the response to uh, specific foods. Um, and so these are individual correlations, but then we associated, uh, we took all of them together and we developed a machine learning algorithm based on uh, a random forest uh, 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 platform and uh, in a cross-validation manner, we saw that we could greatly improve over the state of the art, which is to use the amount of carbohydrates in the meal. That's the correlation on the left shown here as 0.38. Uh, 
and we greatly improved on that to uh, essentially moving from uh, a correlation of 0.38, which explains about 15% of the variability in people's blood sugar response. We moved to 0.68, which is uh, approaching 50% of the variability now being explained by uh, this model, which also integrates all of the individual uh, uh, personal features, including the features coming from the gut bacteria. And we were very happy to see that after developing the model on an initial set of 800 participants, taking that same model and applying it to a new cohort of 100 individuals that we selected in the same way, we saw essentially exactly the same uh, predictive ability of this model uh, to explain these uh, newly collected 100 individuals. Uh, and so the final step in this project was to ask whether uh, we could use this algorithm to actually design personalized diets for people that would normalize blood glucose uh, levels. And so what we did was to um, collect a new cohort, a smaller cohort of 26 participants. And after one week of profiling, uh, we randomized them, and this was a, a double-blinded uh, study. So both the uh, dietitian giving the recommendations and the person receiving did not know which recommendations they were, uh, they were getting, which diet they were, uh, they were getting. And for each individual, we designed two diets, one that we call a good diet, designed to contain meals and foods that would not spike glucose levels in the individual, and another, uh, exactly the same amount of calories. In fact, every meal was designed to have exactly the same uh, calories, but one that we called a bad diet, which was designed to create spikes in glucose levels in that individual. And, and the two diets for each person were, were personalized, namely, the foods prescribed by the algorithm were ones predicted by the algorithm to either not spike or spike glucose levels in that particular individual. And I should mention that there were some foods that were given to some participants in their good diet and to others in uh, their bad diet. And so participants were then uh, monitored by glucose, uh, uh, by this glucose monitor for one week, during which bacterial composition was also uh, collected. Uh, and, and, the, um, and the blood sugar levels were, 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 were measured uh, throughout the week. And, and just to show you uh, that these diets are not the trivial ones that you might expect, here they are for one individual, and, and you can take a moment to see if you can guess for yourself which diet for this individual was the good diet and, and which was the bad diet. As you're looking at that, notice that uh, both of these diets, in fact, contain foods that uh, probably would not be prescribed by the average dietitian giving uh, a diet that's supposed to uh, to be a healthy diet or to normalize blood sugar levels. They, one contains ice cream, the other contains chocolate. Um, and for this particular individual, um, the diet on the right, the one with uh, the ice cream and, and uh, what we love here in Israel, the hummus and the pita, was, was actually prescribed uh, as the good diet. And what I'll show you in the next slide is, is actually how these diets worked in that individual by looking at their blood glucose levels. And I should mention that uh, almost all 26 individuals in this last interventional cohort were pre-diabetic individuals, meaning individuals whose uh, glucose control is already abnormal. And the next result is, uh, uh, in our view, perhaps the most striking that came out of the study. So uh, here are the glucose levels of this individual when, when following the bad diet. And uh, you can see clearly spikes in glucose levels uh, after consuming these meals predicted by the algorithm to cause spikes. You can see also blood glucose levels going uh, to very high levels. These are, these are abnormal levels after, uh, after uh, um, a meal, indicating that this participant is, is very well uh, likely a, a pre-diabetic. And what I'll show you next is uh, the same individual following the good diet, and I remind you, exactly the same amount of calories for every meal. Here are the blood glucose levels shown in green, and you can see uh, we achieved full normalization of blood glucose levels, uh, essentially with no spikes in glucose levels following that diet with, uh, with the ice cream and the hummus and the pita and, uh, and, and so on, and exactly the same amount of calories as uh, the diet um, prescribed to be the bad one. And, and we saw very similar uh, results across most participants that underwent uh, this trial, essentially the bad diet um, with the same amount of calories as the good diet, inducing much larger spikes in glucose levels as 
compared to the good diet. Uh, and finally, we also track uh, gut bacteria throughout this short-term dietary intervention. So by and large, I should mention that uh, the overall bacterial composition of individuals remained relatively stable. So individuals still were more similar to themselves at the end of this short-term intervention than to, uh, to others. However, uh, when we asked about still the more subtle changes that occurred, we could find several consistent changes that were, um, that were significant, namely changes that uh, in most individuals tended to occur after consuming the good diet and other changes tended to occur after consuming uh, the bad diet. And, and some of these uh, are shown here. Now, not a lot is known about the specific bacteria that went either up or down, but in all of those very few cases where something was known, it seemed that the good diet, even though the diet itself was different between individuals, but in all cases, it had the commonality of normalizing blood glucose levels, it seemed that this good uh, diet, uh, in, in fact, uh, induced uh, beneficial changes in good bacteria. And what I mean by that is that, uh, for example, bacteria where low levels were associated with uh, type 2 uh, diabetes, those tended to, uh, to increase following, uh, following uh, the, the good diet. So, of course, this should be taken with, um, with, with, with caution because uh, these are just associations. But, but again, in all cases where we found associations between different levels of specific bacteria, the direction of change induced by the good diet seem to suggest a, a beneficial association, which is intriguing because it may suggest that these dietary changes not only are beneficial for the week during which they actually occur, but may also uh, induce longer-term uh, uh, beneficial effects. But this, of course, requires uh, further research.